Hi, and welcome back to Scotty's Tech.info. I'm Scotty with my co-host Cletus. And this episode is about lightning and surge protectors. So, uh, lightning is a pretty nifty thing. Your average lightning bolt, typically they have a voltage somewhere like, it depends, depends on the size of the lightning bolt. There's like positive and negative lightning. It gets really complicated. So just for simplicity's sake, we'll say that your average lightning bolt has a voltage somewhere between like, you know, can be hundreds of millions of volts up to 1 billion volts for the biggest lightning strikes. And the currents involved are on the order of something like 30,000 amps all the way up to 200,000 amps. Now, that's a lot of juice. So if we take like, say, let's say you have like a relatively small lightning strike and it's 100 million volts and 30,000 amps. Well, power equals voltage times current, as we all know, so that gives you a power of three terawatts for that lightning strike. Now, that's kind of a lot of power because if you think about it, like let's say uh, a modern nuclear reactor might be, you know, like 800, me you know, 800 megawatts, 800 million watts up to uh, over one gigawatt, which is one billion watts. And for our example lightning strike, we're talking about three terawatts or three trillion watts. So you might think that like, well, that's a lot of power and it is, but there's a catch. A nuclear power station can supply its power, let's say 800 megawatts, continuously. A lightning strike, on the other hand, is actually very, very, very short. Lightning strikes are typically on the order of like a few microseconds or millionths of a second. So the thing is, when you plug a gizmo into your wall socket and you're using power from the power company, you get billed by kilowatt hours. And what that means is that if you use one kilowatt of electricity, for one hour, you pay for one kilowatt hour of electricity. But in the case of our example, our three terawatt lightning strike, let's say it takes, let's be generous and say five microseconds for the zap to occur. Well, if you convert that to kilowatt hours using some you know, simple math, you end up with something like you know four kilowatt hours of electricity. So that's the equivalent of, let's say, um, two electric heaters that you're running for only one hour. So <clears throat> this is actually kind of a key uh, trick of lightning, let's call it, because even though the powers involved and the voltages involved and the currents involved, therefore, are absolutely massive, the amount of, of electrical energy being dissipated, it's, it's being dissipated in an extremely short amount of time, microseconds, and that makes a big difference. So well, why is that important? It's important because lightning is destructive because of the incredibly high voltages, because any material that doesn't normally conduct electricity will conduct if you apply a high enough voltage. So like wood doesn't conduct electricity normally, but if you, if you shoot a lightning bolt through it, it's going to blow up. So the other part is the, the currents involved in the lightning strike are also extremely high. They're very, very short, but they're extremely large. And this is kind of the key point. In terms of surge suppression, the big problem with very large amounts of current flowing through a lightning strike in a very, very short amount of time means that when you, you essentially get a, a, a massive current spike, the current ramps up very, very quickly in a really, really short amount of time. And when that happens, you get this big electromagnetic field that's generated. So when the lightning strikes, it doesn't even have to hit your house, it can hit near your house or near the power lines, the aerial power lines connecting the power company to your house. Lightning strikes somewhere nearby. That big electromagnetic field is generated from the massive current flowing, which induces a voltage and a current to, fl to flow in the power lines. Now, typically power line towers actually have their own lightning arresters and stuff, and those are usually pretty effective, but that doesn't necessarily stop surge currents from actually getting to your electrical panel and even into your house. And this is why we have surge suppressors. Because if you don't have a surge suppressor, things tend to get destroyed, and that's not good. Okay, so what's actually in a typical surge suppressor? Well, typically they use a thing called an MOV. And that is a metal oxide varistor. 
There are other components that are used in surge suppressors, but the sort of like the main component is an MOV. And what this is, is usually it's blue. I'm not sure why. Maybe somebody liked the color blue. It looks like a little blue disc, just like that. And it's got two little legs that come off of it. And the idea here is actually pretty simple. When you apply a voltage across these two terminals, um, let's say uh, let's say this is an MOV with a rating of like 275 volts and you know like I don't know uh, 40,000 amps and uh, it has a maximum voltage of like you know uh, V max is like uh, 1.2 kilovolts right okay so what happens is when you apply a voltage across these two pins, if it's less than the voltage rating, this guy doesn't do anything. So if you put like, you know, 100 volts here, nothing happens. If you put like 200 volts, nothing happens. If you put 230 volts, nothing happens. If you put 280 volts, uh-oh, that's greater than 275 volts. So what happens is this guy starts to conduct electricity and he can conduct up to whatever it's rated for, you know, tens of thousands of amps uh, quite frequently. Um, okay, so it's just a little gizmo that it doesn't conduct electricity until the voltage exceeds whatever its rating is, and then it will, it will conduct current at or above that voltage, and Bob's your uncle, right? Well, okay, why does that matter? It matters because... You have your typical electrical installation here, right? So you have, say, uh, this is your your main breaker, right? And then over here you'll have, like, you know, your electrical panel. We'll just draw it. You know, here's your here's your GFCI, and these are all circuit breakers on there. You know, blah blah blah. And then. Down here you'll have a circuit breaker, and down here you'll have a surge suppressor. All right, so your main breaker, well, this is single phase by the way, your main breaker is, there's your neutral, and your neutral goes down to there, and your neutral goes down to the the surge suppressor, and then you have your live or phase, whatever you want to call it. He goes down to the surge suppressor, and he also goes to your, your breaker panel. He goes down to there, and then somewhere in your panel, let's say at the bottom, you have your grounding bar, right? So this guy gets grounded to the grounding bar, and this of course goes into your ground rod into the earth, and there you go, right? Well, okay. This is what the system looks like if you don't have a surge suppressor. You've got your main breaker, it's connected to rows of GFCI, RCDs, and circuit breakers, blah, blah, blah. If you add a surge suppressor, usually, typically, sometimes these two things are, are uh, the breaker and the actual, um, the actual surge suppressor are integrated into one unit. Um, my particular installation works like this, so what you do is you actually, from your main breaker, you tie live and neutral to a circuit breaker, which is about 20 amps, you use the same diameter wire, and then the output of that breaker goes to this guy, which is your, your surge protector. All right, well, so what does that have to do with MOVs? Well, kind of the key component in the surge protector is an MOV, so you can kind of think of each of these, one protecting live, one protecting neutral, as our little, our little friendly guy with legs, right? Essentially what happens is under normal conditions, let's say this is 230 volts, your stuff is working, you're fine, right? When there's a surge, if you don't have any of this, the surge just goes through your panel and into any gizmos you have plugged in and things explode, right? Well, if you have a surge protector, this guy down here, recall that he is actually rated at 275 volts, so if the voltage coming from the power company is less than 275, he does nothing. If there's a nearby lightning strike, 
and then the voltage, the surge on the power lines will be an increased voltage and increased current, right? So what actually happens is this guy will start conducting, and when he starts conducting, the voltage here will get too high, and he will go, oh, I'm going to dump all this current to ground. And so he essentially shorts, he basically turns on and shorts that surge current to ground, which protects your breaker panel and the rest of your installation. And that's pretty much it. That's just kind of how they work. <clears throat> now, it may get a little bit confusing here because you say, well, hang on a minute, didn't you say that this surge protector that has these MOVs uh, was rated to like 40,000 amps? And yet here you have a 20 amp circuit breaker. Uh, what's the deal there? Well, that's actually pretty simple because uh, typical circuit breakers, they don't trip instantaneously. And remember that uh, when a lightning strike happens, it's happening on the order of microseconds. So the surge current that's coming through here is a very, very sharp spike. So this guy isn't necessarily going to trip for very short, very high spikes. That, that surge current will actually be dumped through the MOV to ground and won't actually damage him. Well, okay, but then why have a normal circuit breaker there in front of your, your surge protector? The reason is because these little MOVs here, when they fail, they actually become a short circuit. Oops, he's failed. And what that means is that your... Oops, that's the wrong line. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> we'll do it like that. Da -da 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 don't have enough colors. So when the MOV fails, it becomes a short circuit, which essentially connects your live or your neutral directly to ground, which is going to cause your main breaker to trip. So you put a circuit breaker in between your main breaker and your surge protector, because if this is a short, this guy will trip, because we're not talking about a spike anymore, we're talking about a short condition, which means this guy will trip and he will cut off that guy and Bob's your uncle, your main breaker doesn't trip and your house stays powered. Now what this means is that you have to actually look at these guys. In fact, I have a, they typically look like this. Uh, they look kind of like circuit breakers, but they have cartridges that you stick into them. And the reason that I've drawn these little green dots here is because when one of these fails, this is actually an example of a, a Saltec cartridge. Let me rotate it that way. This little green guy right here when this guy fails, this green guy will turn red. So this little window here will turn red. This will be a short circuit usually. That will trip this breaker and this guy gets disconnected. It's also convenient because if I have a circuit breaker here and I want to replace one of these cartridges, then all I have to do is flip this breaker off, yank the bad cartridge out, stick the new cartridge in, and flip it back on. Okay, so MOVs actually will fail um, sometimes they fail because they're they're dumping very small currents to ground repeatedly. Sometimes there's like a really close lightning strike and it's a massive surge and this guy just goes kaput. Um, so they do need to be replaced after a while. Uh, the other thing is that something like this, like a whole house surge suppressor, is way, way better than the crappy little surge protection that you get in the, the little surge protectors that are also power strips. Those typically use like an MOV and maybe another component or two, but they're generally not nearly as good as like an actual like professionally installed real honest to God whole house surge suppressor. There's like a big difference between them. Now there are a couple of gotchas that you have to be aware of. If you're going to actually add one of these to your house, you must, must, must absolutely consult the rules and regulations for your area because if you don't, you can actually make a boo-boo. You can actually make the situation worse. And the reason for that is if you hook things together like this, then you're fine. As long as typically this, the distance of this connection and this connection and your ground connection is supposed to be less than 50 centimeters usually. That's the first thing. The second thing is you should not actually run your ground wire. 
So your surge current is coming through here, it's going down through your breaker, it's going down through your surge protector, and then it's going to go to ground. Well, what if I put ground, maybe my ground connection is like up here in some weird place or something, right? What if, what if I did this? That's actually very bad because what can happen is there's a giant surge on the line, right? So you get this current flowing through the breaker here and it's being shunted to ground, right? What happens is it travels around the ground wire. This is, this is connected to ground up here, right? Except you notice that this, this ground wire, which is conducting the surge into the earth, it's running the wire here, your ground wire here, is parallel to the wires here that are feeding the surge protector. That's bad because it's kind of like a lightning strike. You get a surge that comes in and it goes down here and it goes down here and then this guy starts conducting and tries to dump it to ground but it flows back up here but it's exactly like a lightning strike. This big current is flowing here but these wires are parallel. So suddenly you get a feedback condition where this guy is going to induce a voltage and you're going to have an increased current flowing in here and this basically runs around in circles like this and then this guy explodes. That's, that's kind of simplified, but that's the basic, that's the gist of it. So if you're going to install one of these yourself, check all the rules and regulations, the electric code in your area, um, and you have to be very careful about if you have like your live and your neutral uh, coming in and your ground wire, you shouldn't run all these wires in parallel. If, if, if possible, don't run them anywhere near each other. If they have to actually cross, make sure they're perpendicular to one another because parallel wires will couple together due to the large current spikes and it gets all crazy and hairy. So, uh, like I say, check your local electrical code and if possible, just have it professionally installed because then you're sure you're, you'll be, you're sure that you're not going to do it wrong and everything will be golden. Anyway, so that's the story. Uh, lightning is pretty cool. And um, that's pretty much the gist of, of surge suppressors and how they work. As I said, be careful if you're going to install your own. Make sure you know what you're doing because it's not as simple as just putting in a new circuit breaker or a new GFCI slash RCD. Or, um, you're talking about very, very short, very, very, very short, very, very high spikes of current and that causes all kinds of crazy electromagnetic things to occur and if you do it wrong you can actually destroy your rather expensive surge suppressor fairly quickly. These guys were oh I think it was about uh, 300 euros or something for the the actual module and and one set of replacement cartridges so yeah they're not cheap so you don't want to blow it up. Right so I guess that's about it. For more techie tips, see scottystech.info. Thanks for watching. See you next time.